We welcome you to our course today on behalf of the Refinitiv Academy. It is my pleasure to host this course on the Refinitiv Real-Time Connector. I'm Mark Oller, a Customer Success Manager with Refinitiv based in Atlanta. And joining us today is Mahesh, our Technical Specialist Manager in our development team out of Oakbrook, Illinois. Many of you in this session have undoubtedly worked with Mahesh in the past, uh, be it in a course or for design or system capability considerations. During this session, uh, I'll be muting the line for general flow, but if you have a question, please, please feel free to ask uh, using the chat feature. Uh, on the lower right hand side of your screen, you'll see a chat icon. Feel free to drop in questions there uh, to the Ron Carta ID. That's what I am uh, logged in under. Um, we'll shoot to go over as many questions as we can during the presentation. Any that run over or require follow up, uh, we'll ensure you get uh, we get back to you as soon as we possibly can. Okay, I have to present the uh, the routine disclaimer, uh, which I, I won't read to you in its entirety as that will just take away from Ash's presentation time. Uh, in short, uh, the presentation is for information purposes only and is not intended as any form of advice uh, for trading or investments. Okay, on that note, let's uh, go ahead and move forward to the presentation. Uh, during today's review, we will be covering a lot of ground in a relatively short period of time for those of you that have been on discussions uh, like these before, uh, given this topic. Howard, uh, don't feel any undue pressure to take quick notes as I will be forwarding this presentation to you afterwards. I'll now hand off to Mahesh to go ahead and start with our agenda and then flow into today's discussion topic. Thank you, Mark. Uh, hi. Yeah, so today we will cover about uh, the RTC. Uh, I will start with an overview of what RTC is, how it came about, uh, what can you do with it, uh, what are its capabilities. Uh, then we will dive a little deeper into the threading models because that's one of the fundamental ways in which you can fully leverage the capability of the RTC uh, depending on your deployment needs. And this is a, a product that is fully threaded uh, so, so I want to make sure that uh, we convey that information and then some of the configurations and the tuning and what is the approach to achieve optimal performance you know, for any given use case. And then we have some uh, performance results on the HP Gen 10 Skylake servers. Uh, more to follow on that one. We will be doing more things this quarter. Uh, so I will just touch upon what we have published already. Okay, so before we get into the RTC overview, uh, what we will see in the next slide is just a general uh, RTDS deployment. Uh, if you look at it, uh, we have a multicast backbone where through an ADH, we bring in different sources of information, whether it is from uh, Refinitiv, you know, uh, through an edge device or direct feeds or uh, in-house applications publishing the data uh, using our RTSDK APIs um, or third-party vendors. So there are multiple ways which you can bring in the data. It is interest-driven on the backbone, so the ADS will subscribe based on the client interest and then unpass the information to the uh, consuming applications, whether they are RSSL-based or SSL WebSocket. Uh, we also have the REST API support. and. All of the uh, entitlement is done via DAX. Yeah, uh, the, both the ADH and the ADS can run the DAX demons, which communicate with the station. Uh, so that's kind of the typical flow of the data in a uh, you know distribution system. So, Mark, if we can go next, um, yeah, the next one. Right. So uh, how did we come about with the RDC? So basically uh, what we did is we took the, the top half of the ADH and the bottom half of the ADS. So that way the communication with the publishing side remained TCP. The communication to the subscriber side remained uh, TCP. And we took out the RRMP layers uh, that, that would be based on the UDP multicast, RSCP, a daemon or daemonless. So 
So we end up with all the known functionality of the RTDS. And so that's what became RTC. So Mark, yeah. So what this gives us is in uh, environments such as the cloud where there is no native multicast support of uh, to scale, this gives us an option to deploy RTC while leveraging the full functionality that customers are already using today with their uh, RTDS, ADH, ADS deployment. So uh, just following on that, from a connectivity point of view, you can connect up the RTC to you know any number of sources, any of the sources that you already know, uh, whether it is you know the edge device or the uh, real time direct or our cloud offering uh, real time optimized or managed solution through RTMDS. Uh, you can also do the contribution for RCC uh, and you can have your own in-house publishers based on RTSDK or uh, the SSL API. So, or you can just connect to an upstream um, RTDS that is there if you want to uh, do it that way. So, you know, all of these kinds of capability connectivity is in place. And uh, so, you know, the known client applications connect and we do the um, entitlement via DAX. So you run a DAX daemon along with the RTC. So nothing really changes there. So that's kind of how you can deploy this. Yeah. So the next slide shows you a page full of functionality. It is mainly there to show you that look, the capabilities that you already have come to know uh, and use over the years continues to function. So the only thing that is different is we do not have the uh, tick by tick uh, source mirroring capability because that would require uh, implementation wise the multicast based backbone that is there with the uh, RTDS. What we do have in its place is the provider warm standby and we also added the preferred active server because that's a feature that is there with the source mirroring. And as you can see here, you know, every every feature that uh, we use uh, to the traditional RTDS is available through uh, RTC. Yeah. Next. Yeah. So from a deployment point of view, uh, with uh, yesterday's uh, 353 release, we do have native Red Hat 8 binary. So that's something new that just became available. Uh, and then, you know, it, it's available on Red Hat 7. Uh, you can run the same binary on Oracle Linux uh, while using Red Hat compatible kernel or CentOS 7.x. Uh, you can also use it on the Amazon Linux 2 in AWS. You can deploy on physical servers. You can virtualize using the VMware or you can uh, do the Docker containers. We provide Docker files uh, for each release. It's uh, hosted on the Docker Hub. Uh, and we also do the security scanning of these things. Uh, so the container images are uh, scanned using the twist lock and uh, the software is uh, scanned using Veracode and Black Duck. And uh, you can deploy it on all three public clouds, AWS, Azure, and GCP. Um, so that's those are all the de deployment options for RTC. Gosh, I've had a, a great couple of great questions come up. And I don't want to queue these up until the end because I think they really, they really fit into the flow of what we're talking about right now. Sure. Uh, there's a question in um, talking about or asking about how does RTC differ from ADS POP? Okay, it, it is the same as ADS POP, right? It's a it's a branding thing. It's a new name, and you know, so the configuration, the monitoring, everything is uh, the same. Yeah, so it is scoped differently. But if you are using ADS POP, uh, all, all, it, it is the same as the RTC. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and, and one other minor thing is uh, the ADS POP, even though internally uh, we all have used it and some of our customers have also used it extensively, the documentation was very sparse. Yeah. So now uh, we have a full set of documentation for RTC, the sysadmin guide. And since we have been working with the cloud providers, we also have a cloud deployment manual Yeah, that goes into details of deploying it in uh, each of the three clouds. And so that's that's another another thing. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, same individual had another good one. Same topic. Uh, are there any plans to end of life the ADS POP? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, I think uh, Jeff Sol, our product manager, has product roadmaps uh, that you can see on myrefinitive.com. Um, no, it's it's uh, nothing has been discussed along those lines, and it's not on our roadmap. So, if you already have ADS POP, yeah, this will continue to function. Very good. Thank you. Okay, I'll uh, I'll turn it back over to you on next. 
All right, let's go to the next uh, one. So yeah, so I think we touched upon this as part of uh, answering the question. Yeah, so as you can see, you have far more documentation now um, for the RTC than we ever had for the ADS pub before. Uh, the cloud administration manual is uh, another interesting one for me because you know we get feedback from our cloud service provider partners that we are working with, so we continue to evolve that documentation. So that should be a good good reference for those who want to move in that direction. <coughs> So, uh, so okay, so if we have an existing RTDS deployment, how can we uh, go uh, with an RTC-based solution, let's say in the cloud, right? So you can really have two layers, this is what we recommend, yeah, two layers of the RTC, the caching layer at the top that will communicate to the uh, sources and it will do the caching of the data, it will do the multiple quality of service so that there is no duplication of the functionality uh, at the distribution level. And also, you know, you have the uh, data cached for quicker access. Yeah. So, and the bottom layer, uh, the distribution layer, as we call it, is where you do the fan out, uh, where you do the conversion, where you do the last mile things, uh, you know, compression, encryption, whatever you want to do. Uh, and you can also enable the warm standby so that it will have multiple routes to the caching layer for uh, resiliency. So that's kind of at a high level how you can build out uh, a fully uh, TCP mesh based architecture. Um, so this is this is kind of what we do at a high level with an RTO. So this is a well vetted architecture that is uh, used internally to provide data for RTO uh, consumers. It's the same software stack, so the same functionality. So you, you get the benefit of something that has been proven and you know you, you you get a lot of things for free in that sense yeah so we continue to evolve it based on the requirements so that's that's at a high level the architecture so if you can go to the next one mark i just want to point out a couple of things so so you know yes this will be a new architecture you're yeah, moving away from the multicast to a full tcp based solution so you will have to think through certain things when you do this yeah so when you replace the adh we'll have to reconfigure the application endpoints uh, and one other thing which is uh, different in practice is the dynamic discovery of sources. Yeah. So on a multicast backbone, a new source application presents itself. Yes, you will configure it on the ADH, but from an ADS point of view, it sees that uh, immediately. Yeah. So in this case, if you add a new source to an existing RTC, let's say at the caching layer, the the fan outs that are connected to that one will certainly know about it so we do have that functionality but if a source comes up on an rtc cache that the fan out hasn't yet connected it doesn't know so so you do you can leverage we have the dynamic route add uh, delete functionality yeah so you can the, you can add the routes uh, you know on demand so you don't need to restart so that is something to keep in mind and obviously, we, we touched up on the warm standby instead of the source mirroring. Uh, so instead of the tick by tick, you have a replay of conflated updates in that case. Uh, um, but on the uh, changing side of things here, you no longer have a single standby server. So you can actually achieve greater resiliency uh, by having multiple standby servers. Uh, in the uh, typical RTDS deployment, you have a single standby in an SM pair. Yeah, so that's something about the warm standby capability. So nothing changes at the fan out RTC level. Yeah, you get to do everything, entitlement, encryption, compression, conversion, um, all those things work. And we have some performance numbers because, uh, you know, it is a question as to, okay, when we do this, how performant is the RTC? And, uh, you know, in, with the multicast, you kind of uh, publish once and uh, there are multiple subscribers. Yeah, whereas here in the TCP, world, uh, you will have to send out uh, the message multiple times. So we have some fan out numbers uh, that are available, we have published, so you can look at that. And manageability uh, is the same, yeah, you can use the REST interface. I think we had a webinar yesterday uh, demonstrating that capability. And if you are on-prem and you still want to use the shared memory uh, being on the same node uh, while you're running the RTC that's available, uh, that continues to be available. Right, uh, and as far as this particular architecture, you can uh, deploy it in cloud or on-prem. It's the it's the same thing that could be done. So next, Mark. 
So, you know, one, one other way of looking at this is, you know, if you have like a branch site uh, where you don't want to have multiple layers of RTC, you can certainly collapse that functionality. You can do the caching and the distribution all in a single layer of RTC. So there will be some replication of the functionality of the cache if you do this way, but uh, RTC is highly performant. So you can certainly do this. Uh, what happens, let's say an RTC that the client application uh, is connected to fails, then there will be a client application or an API led recovery that has to happen. Uh, and about the warm standby that we touched upon, what happens there, right? So we, if the upstream uh, supports the warm standby, um, then you can certainly do that, right? You can connect to, for example, your own RTDS and uh, you can enable the uh, warm standby capability that has to be enabled on the upstream as well. So then that you can leverage that, yeah. So that, that would be if you want to uh, go with another deployment model instead of the two layer. Uh, so that's, that's an option. Yeah. All right, now uh, let me touch upon the threading model, right? So basically now uh, we have four threading models, if you will, right? So the first threading model is the one that has been there forever, right? So you do all of the data flow through the main thread. Uh, and we have a couple of other threads for doing the name resolution or REST uh, manageability uh, snapshot. But other than that, the image request responses for all other types of subscribers just flow through the main thread, right? So that is useful if depending on, you know, uh, how many client applications you have, how much data you are bringing in. Um, a variation of that that has been there for, you know, this is uh, well vetted for over a decade is you use the main thread for communication with the publisher, but then you have a number of writer threads that you can scale horizontally. And th those are the ones that uh, communicate with the subscribers. And this is also suitable when you have, you know, large number of client connections, but you don't have a, a high uh, message rate coming in. Yeah. So that that is the second threading model. The next one that has been around for a couple of years now is if you have high message rates coming in to the RTC, a single main thread becomes the bottleneck, right? Instead, we can do the horizontal scaling. We can have a number of item threads to take the load. Uh, in this case, one thing to keep in mind is the main thread still makes the communication to the publisher for you know source directory synchronization, but the message flow is via the item threads to the writer thread and onto the subscriber. And the next one that just has been qualified and has become available as of 353 that was released yesterday. Um, so if you have the item threads all speaking to the publisher, that is great. But depending on your message rates, you know, somebody wanted to do 6 million updates per second. Yes, the item threads can do it, but depending on the clock frequency, uh, you needed 12 item threads. Yeah. So that means you have 12 plus one connections going in each route to the publisher. So that's a little difficult to manage. And also it results in not a good batching at the publisher level. Right. So uh one of the things you can do now is instead of the item threads connecting to the publisher we have channel threads so there is another layer of threading in between the item thread and the publishers so we introduce channel thread so the channel threads will communicate with the item threads so you need to have you know a multiplier between the channel thread and the item thread so so you do that and that will simplify the configuration. It will result in better batching. And so that's that's the uh, benefit of using the channel thread. Uh, so far, based on some of the initial performance numbers I have done seen, uh, channel thread can give you the throughput of, let's say four item threads. So you should be able to drive four item threads as we test on uh, different uh, hardware with a greater number of cores, uh, you know, we'll certainly share those results. So these are kind of the four threading models that are available. Uh, and this is one of the big things when it comes to RTC tuning, right? So to understand what is the requirement and then you can leverage the threading to accomplish what you need. 
Hey, Mahesh, this is Mark. If you would uh, speak up just a little bit louder, I think some of the folks might be having a little bit of uh, issue on volume. So any, uh, any okay. volume that you provide would be great. Thank sure, you. sure, Mark. Yeah. We'll move on. All right. Okay. Let's look at the next. Um, so, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I wanted to share one other thing here, right? So the observability of all the threading that you have, right? Um, so suddenly you can do top. That is what the left side of the screen is showing. Then you can see what are all the uh, threads that are in play. So we have introduced the uh, thread naming going back to the RTDS 3.0 days. So that kind of continues on. And something new to 353 that was released yesterday is we have a thread binding statistics screen for RTDS, whether you use ADH or ADS or RTC. So in one place, you can see all the binding information. So this is kind of nice. Um, uh, you know, so there is a good visibility. So obviously the right-hand side is the static information, what you configured with, and you can obviously change it uh, you know, in runtime, and in that case, you can use the top output to see what is the current binding. You, you don't necessarily change it in production for sure, but you know, that's just an option. So there are a couple of ways in which you can see uh, which threads are being used and what they are bound to. Okay, so all right. So when we look at the configurations and the tuning, so uh, the basic approach of tuning the RTC so one good thing about uh, RTC is you have a single configuration file, yeah, RTC.cnf that is shipped. It is tuned for throughput uh, by default, and it's a good starting point. As you will see in the next two to three slides, uh, we just use the default in a large number of cases. And we talked about the different threading models for this reason that you need to, uh, you know, choose appropriate number of item threads, channel threads, writer threads, depending on, you know, message rates, how much compute and bandwidth is available and what kind of client connections you have. For example, the RWF is obviously, you know, a binary format. Yeah, it is the most efficient. But uh, if you already have existing applications, uh, which are SSL based, or you have web socket connections, right? So there is data conversion that needs to take place. That means you probably do more writer threads. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the compression is another last mile activity. So it's encryption. So those are the things for which you need greater number of writer threads, yeah? So this is kind of the uh, design decision you will have to make. Uh, and we publish the performance documents and you can use that as a reference, as a starting point uh, for your deployments. So that's the uh, key thing when it comes to tuning the RTC for optimal uh, benefit. Uh, process thread and interrupt binding to minimize the pneumo migration, yeah? That is something that you typically do uh, so that you should continue to do that and the uh, performance is also impacted by the publisher and the subscriber settings. Yeah, so is there message packing? Uh, that is one of the reasons why we mentioned channel threads. Yeah, so if you use a smaller number of uh, uh, channel threads as opposed to a large number of item threads connecting upstream, then there is better message packing for the same data rate. Yeah, uh, and then the open window uh, that comes into play when you do the image retrievals, a TCP no delay, a TCP send receive buffer. So these are all the things that uh, used at the publisher subscriber settings that has an impact as well. So in here, uh, so I think our route defaults are probably two meg by now. Um, and one key thing is, so we have this round trip latency functionality. I think it's been there uh, going back to some version of 3.3. We must have changed the default to true now because of the huge value we see that in uh, actual usage, yeah? So you can use this to track the round-trip latency. Uh, you can see the re TCP retransmissions, right? So that is a very, very uh, useful functionality if you are seeing channel cuts at market open or market close, uh, you know, so you can measure the round-trip latency. If you see it, you know, spike up substantially, very likely you will be seeing the TCP retransmissions that gives you a chance to kind of measure that, document that, and work with your upstream, uh, you know, the router guys to say that, look, this is happening. And we did have a use case where they had to make changes to increase the buffering, and that resulted in fewer uh, disconnections. So so this is a very, uh, you know, important uh, feature. And then as you can see, most of the other things, you know, you just can use the defaults, yeah. 
So, so the documentation is pretty much rtc.cnf, and if we make any changes while well, we do the testing, we will show. Uh, Mark, if you can go to the next one. So I think that probably says you know you need to do the uh, you know threads and the thread binding. Yeah. So that's that's part of your capacity sizing. So you can use our published uh, documents results as a starting point uh, because we do get into the details and show the top output so you can see how many cores are used uh, by each thread and how much is used for interrupt handling, etc. So that's that's uh, the key configuration settings when it comes to RTC. All right, so performance results. So uh, it, this is a very simple setup. Yeah, if you want to benchmark, this is what uh, our uh, uh, CSP partners are also using uh, for benchmarking. So we publish the uh, various metrics such as the update throughput, fan out, uh, how many connections can we support if you assume a certain inbound message rate uh, and uh, you know, conflation throughput, uh, cost of encryption. I think we published the numbers for the RSSL encryption, the WebSocket encryption. Uh, as a feature became available in uh, 352 at the end of Q2, so we will be publishing those numbers out uh, in Q4. Uh, image retrieval, yeah, so streaming and snapshot. Uh, so these are all the different metrics that we publish, compression efficiency. You can even measure that in real time, yeah, so that variable is there in the shared memory. We provide all of these metrics for different client protocols, yeah. So WebSocket, RSSL, SSL. Mark, if you go to the next one. So there are a couple of links there. So these are the results that we published last year and early this year. Uh, this is a couple of uh, uh, numbers on the DL380s, the Gen 8 2 by 8 cores. Uh, so either using just the main thread or the one with the item and the writer threads. and this quarter we are getting started benchmarking on Red Hat 8 uh, and one of the other uh, things that we are doing is we are going to be using a bigger update message. So we looked at the data we were using and we realized over the years that uh, the venues have added more fits, our timestamp granularity has increased and you know there are some certain other fits that have been added uh, by our own head end system. So the update message sizes that we were using uh, for which you are seeing the numbers below, they were all based on the 74 byte RWF. But we have a new sample uh, performance.xml that we are shipping in the uh, 353 package. That's 130 byte uh, RWF update message. So that's what we'll be using for benchmarking uh, going forward. And uh, yeah, we'll publish the numbers for channel threads uh, and with socket encryption and the rest snapshot. So the rest snapshot functionality has been around, but we really didn't have the tool to do the testing. Uh, now with 353, test client gives you the option to do the rest snapshot uh, testing. So uh, the data flow is slightly different for the rest. It goes through the rest thread. Yeah. So so that's something to keep in mind. We'll we'll share the details. So. Uh, preliminary observations I have, yeah, the rest snapshot, uh, at least from a tool point of view, uh, you know, each one is a different TCP connection in itself, yeah. So if you use the batch mode, then you get 10 times the performance. I think that's probably a good idea to do as well in real life. Uh, as far as the numbers go, I think the left-hand side is showing you that if you use the writer thread, you can scale, and it is showing you that, you know, we were able to, uh, you know, saturate up to 30 Gbps on a two by eight uh, machine uh, and there's a 20% encryption cost. Yeah, if you want to fully encrypt your data flow and the one in the middle shows you, okay, so if you increase the number of item threads, you know, how it scales. Um, so, so, you know, you could do this or you could use the channel threads now with the 353. So that will kind of simplify um, uh, the uh, connectivity and the numbers. So we will, we will share that detail. And on the right hand side, it is showing you that you can go to a bigger instance size. So this is a two by 16 instead of the two by eight. And, you know, we were able to achieve the six million updates per second that was needed for certain deployment. Uh, actually, we could even exceed it uh, by going with the 15 item threads with the 8.1 million updates per second that we see there. But that's where, you know, some of the uh, configuration becomes a bit more complex and channel thread simplifies that. Uh, and also, you know, conflation. We improved the performance of conflation in uh, 351 at the beginning of the year, 
So if you do 100 millisecond conflation, that is showing a 15% cost. Yeah. Next, next slide, Mark. So this is probably the last slide. So yeah, so we have you know uh, the other metric that we publish that shows you how many number of connections can you make to an RTC, and we kept as many things constant as possible. Uh, so we said, okay, well, we won't use any more than eight CPU cores, irrespective of the connection type, and total bandwidth is 20 Gbps in this case because certainly in the cloud 25 Gbps is. Uh, widely available, uh, 100 Gbps is also there. We use the standard MTU, um, and you know, so we fix the inbound message rate. So we set three updates per second per item, and we enable the caching. And this shows you, you know, the types of connections you make and how many such connections can you make to uh, an RTC. What can it support? Yeah. So that's another metric uh, that's uh, useful. So the next one, uh, okay, so yeah, okay. So this is more for the cloud deployment and this is kind of the discussions we are having with the CSPs, right? So on-prem we do the uh, system tuning, yeah, the BIOS, the OS, the network adapter tuning. Uh, and on the application side, yeah, we can do the software tuning. We just have to use the threading model uh, that we need, uh, process interrupt binding. Uh, so the application tuning largely remains the same when you go to the cloud, but you don't have access to the underlying node many times. So what are some of the best practice recommendations for our workload? Yeah. So that's kind of what we are working with the CSPs. And when they publish their uh, results, uh, we will see, uh, you know, what, what would be their recommendations for this workload. Yeah. So that's probably all I had. Uh, I don't think there's anything else, Mark. Yeah, so we are on to the Q&A. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll dive into the Q&A. We've had some good questions. I've been trying to filter them in as you were speaking to tie them while the topic was hot. Uh, there was one I queued up towards the end. Uh, it was about um, our always popular licensing. Um, it was, the reference was, bear with me. Uh, is there, Mahesh, is there a different license to the ADS? or a, a different license as compared to the ADS to do this? I, I, I think, yes, there is a different license. Yeah, so the RTC is licensed separately as its own product, right? Uh, and there is a max items in and a max items out as two different variables to the other things that you already know. So that's kind of the uh, change as far as the licensing goes. Yeah. So yes, you, you need a different license for RTC. Okay. Very good. Um, scrolling back through the questions, I think we hit all of them during the flow of the presentation. Uh, if there's anything else, uh, everyone, please you know feel free to forward it uh, to myself uh, or Mahesh. Um, I'll go ahead and jump in uh, next. I want to just go through a real short resource uh, doc for reference. Uh, most of you are probably already aware of the general access numbers for the Refinitive Help Desk. Uh, also note the training link. Uh, you obviously already have the academy link if you signed up for the course. Uh, I would also recommend checking the uh, the catalog of academy courses um, as there are frequently uh, courses being added. Uh, as a reminder, if you have any questions uh, that pop up after the course, you know, feel free to forward these uh, you know, to myself or your CSM for your account. Uh, as our team typically fields questions on this very um, We will in turn get back to you uh, with answers as soon as we possibly can. And again, this uh, the documents you're seeing, I will be forwarding out to uh, people uh, on this call. So you don't have to write any of this down. Okay, in the, uh, in the chat screen, um, I've dropped in a, a link for uh, a survey. Um, and everyone, again, thank you so much for attending the session. Um, our goal is to give you this on trip and evolution with real-time connector, obviously in a relatively short period of time. I mean, I think all of you would agree this discussion can go on for two or three hours um, if you're in person, but this is really a short intro to get you thinking about it and make information uh, available. Uh, I went ahead and added that link in chat. Uh, as feedback is important to us, one item we already have is a takeaway. Obviously, we're going to do some tests on on volume, an item, and we're all of us are fighting working remotely. 
Uh, we'd greatly appreciate if you have a moment to complete. Uh, it's a short one quarter page confidential survey. Uh, it's, it's not a real long where it's 14 pages. Any information you have that helps us do our job better, we definitely appreciate it. 